Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Leanna Hippolit and I'm an assistant professor of educational leadership at Cal Poly Pomona. I'm also a proud class of 2010 Brandeis graduate, and I serve as the co-chair of the Alumni of Color Network for our Brandeis um, organization, as well as a member of our Alumni Association Board of Directors. And it is my ultimate honor, privilege, pleasure to welcome you to today's program on behalf of the Alumni Association featuring Hortense Spillers, the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University, and Shaniqua Roach, Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. This program is co-sponsored by the African and African American Studies Department at Brandeis, as well as the Alumni of Color Network. We are delighted to welcome you, our alumni, parents, Brandeis National Committee members and friends around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. So I wanna take a moment to introduce our speakers for today. I'll start with uh, Dr. Hortense Spillers, an American literary critic, black feminist scholar and the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. Her essays on African-American literature in black, white, and in color, essays on American literature and culture published by the University of Chicago Press in 2003 are foundational. After earning her PhD from Brandeis in 1974, she taught at Wellesley College, Haverford College, Cornell University, Emory University, and Vanderbilt University. Professor Spiller's research addresses psychoanalysis and race, the African diaspora, African American literature and criticism, the representation of race in literature, linguistics, Black culture, and sexuality. She is best known for her 1987 article, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book, one of the most cited essays in African American literacy studies today. She is co founder of The Feminist Wire, an online magazine dedicated to feminist issues and critique. Currently, she is working on two new projects concerning the idea of Black culture and Black women, as well as the early state formation. Professor Spillers has received numerous awards and fellowships during her career. Just this April, she was elected to the prestigious American Academy of the Arts and Sciences and recipient of the Brandeis University Alumni Achievement Award in 2019. Brandeis Provost Emeritus Lisa Lynch describes Spillers as, quote, pioneering professor, feminist scholar, and critic whose contributions had, have influenced the landscape of African American literary studies and advanced Black feminist theory. We're so happy to help you. Happy to have you. Uh, next, our uh, also esteemed speaker, Dr. Shaniqua Roach is an assistant professor of African and African American studies and women's gender and sexuality studies at Brandeis University. Her peer reviewed work has appeared and is forthcoming in many scholarly journals and publications such as Feminist Theory, The Black Scholar, Science, Journal of Women in Culture and Society, Differences, a Journal of Feminist Cultural Studies, Feminist Formations, and many other publication outlets. She is currently working on her book manuscript, Black Dwelling, Homemaking and Erotic Freedom, an intellectual and cultural history of the ways in which Black homes have been tragic sites of state invasion, as well as paradigmatic entry points for Black women artists, activists, and intellectuals to imagine, rehearse, and enact Black erotic freedom. Her research has been supported by an American Council of Learned Societies, ACLS Fellowship, and the Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. She sits on the editorial board of Signs, a journal of women in culture and society. Welcome, Professors Spillers and Roach, and I look forward to your discussion today. Thank you so much, Leanna. So I'm going to lean right in with questions. Professor Spillers, you are a Brandeis alum. We are so fortunate to have you here. And as a continued member of the Brandeis community, could you tell us a bit about your time at Brandeis? Well, thank you very much, uh, Shaniqua. And I want to thank uh, Liana for that wonderful introduction. 
and for Allison and uh, the alumni community for getting us together for this interlocution. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. So you've called upon me to take myself back <laughs> 50 years ago. That was quite, well, 50 years ago and counting what Brandeis was like in, um, in 1968 is probably not imaginable from this vantage because so much has changed um, at Brandeis uh, since those days. Uh, when I was there a couple of years ago, I didn't even recognize the campus. I mean, when, when I was there, that it, it seems to me that there was one way in and one way out Whereas today, it's, um, it's a very different scene. Um, the one thing that, that, that I constantly remember though about um, that particular year and the year that followed is that Brandeis in the context of 1968 was a very dynamic campus. Uh, it, was, it was full of radical uh, transformation because there were two or three movements or currents of movements running through the university uh, at that time. Not only were there many more black students that year at uh, Brandeis, but then Brandeis was also uh, the site of student movement by way of uh, the Vietnam War protests. But 1968 was also the year that uh, Brandeis installed its transitional year program, which brought a large number of uh, black undergraduates uh, to campus. My first job as a graduate student at Brandeis was working for that program. I was a, a young teacher in the transitional year program that was designed to help students, well, do exactly what the program said, make the transition to uh, the freshman year at, uh, at Brandeis. So courses were offered in, um, oh, in, writing, for instance, to prepare students uh, for the first year. There were also, I think that year, uh, an infusion of graduate, more black graduate students. Um, it was not a large number, but I think there were more students that year um, in the graduate school, black students in, uh, in English, anthropology, sociology, at the Heller School uh, than, than there had been before. And so it was in effect what might have been something of uh, a new university in that um, the realities on the ground uh, were so transformative and, and, and so different. And sure enough, that year, that academic year 68-69, uh, saw the creation of uh, Black Studies at, uh, at, at Brandeis with the, taking, with the takeover of Ford Hall, which at the time was the uh, communications center. At, um, at the university and that followed the winter of 1969. And with, with that takeover, uh, one of the demands was the creation of a black studies program. And sure enough, what came out of that um, 10 day movement uh, was the creation of black studies, which might've been one of the first black studies programs on predominantly white campuses in the United States. And so it was in that context that uh, my work for the PhD proceeded. And with that, I would say 
that it meant disruption. <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of days when it was hard to get to class because so much was happening outside the classroom that we could, that, that, well, I guess you could say extracurricular activity uh, that year with uh, demonstrations all over the campus that outside the classroom was as much a classroom as the classroom itself. Uh, I will always think of it uh, that way that I was, I was certainly learning as much outside uh, the classroom as I was inside, or I guess you could say uh, the classroom, the, the inside the classroom was being extended to the outside that started happening in the reverse with the coming about of black studies but those were the days when inner and outer uh converged on uh on a single stage so it was uh it was an exciting time to be there absolutely so you didn't train in black studies you trained in english i trained in english that's right in english and american literature american lit and there you wrote a dissertation yes conversation will soon be published with Duke University Press. That's I'm, right. I'm going to get the book immediately, but could you tell us a bit about that dissertation work, now book project, and your intellectual journey post Brandeis? That work really grows out of uh, my biography, uh, my own uh, human and social history. I grew up in the Southern Black Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. And of course, at the time that um, I was growing up, you know, I had no idea that uh, the rituals that uh, I was observing along with my family had such mm, critical cultural gravity or meaning. I, mean, I really was not aware of that until uh, the King movement. I mean, even though I, I grew up in the church where there was great preaching and speaking and singing and, and music, you know, I, I observed it as a child would observe these things. And, and, and what that means is, okay, you go because your parents make you go and not because you're particularly interested, but because they see to it that 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 you are there, and so you you are absorbing these things, not aware quite yet of 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 what they mean. But once once we reached uh, the fifties and heightened consciousness, a growing consciousness about uh, the meaning of things, I eventually came to understand that these sermons that I was listening to in my church and other churches in the city of Memphis had grave cultural import because I saw them used in a way that was transformative in terms of what was happening uh, politically with black life in the United States. And so once I saw what King was doing with the sermon, mm -hmm. and he wasn't preaching sermons, he was making speeches, but it really was the very same thing in terms of technique, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the mobilization of language in order to be persuasive in order to get um, to move people, in order to get things done, I saw King make use of those techniques that uh, I was aware of as a child, but now became aware of in, in, in a very different way. So once I got to uh, once I got to Brandeis, I was not quite aware that. Um, I was going to study sermons because I came really to the graduate program with an interest in um, William Blake. <laughs> okay. 
William Blake's prophetic books uh, and uh, the English romantic writers. But then once, um, once the Black Studies movement was underway in that crucial year, 68, 69, and, and I can't say exactly how it dawned on me that, um, that most immediately I had another kind of, let's call it a hermeneutic demand, or there was now a necessity to understand something else in detail. And that was um, the idea of, of, of black culture or to take hold of black culture or black history, which I was being exposed to really all the time without really knowing that that was going on, but to come into awareness of it in a systematic way. And that's really where the study of uh, black sermons came from. It really started with my study of Martin Luther King's pulpit style I mean, I saw Martin Luther King uh, persuade mm, thousands of people really to, to risk their life by putting their body on the line in order to change things. And it, it became uh, an entire movement. And I was fascinated by how he could how he could do that with language. And it was a language that I knew very well from all those years of a cultural apprenticeship in the church. And so that's when I set out to, uh, to write a dissertation at a university founded by um, Jewish community under uh, the direction of Professor uh, Alan Grossman who didn't know anything about black sermons, but he was very curious and open to find out. And so we set about looking for a way to do this dissertation, which was completed over a couple of years uh, in the spring of 1974. That's amazing, that's amazing. Yeah. So we, I've asked you this question in another context. Um, how do you, how did you make sense of the gendered politics of some of the black male, somewhat argued charismatic leaders that you were looking at in the dissertation, such as Martin Luther King Jr. And how did you broker that transition from writing about sermons to writing some of the most field defining, the most field defining articles in black feminist thought by the 1980s? Well, it was um, it was an evolution that that that, that sort of worked um, this way. Uh, once I was at Wellesley, I was I was a joint appointment in English and Black Studies from 1974 to uh, the late 70s, when I left uh, Wellesley and headed to the Midwest and the University of Nebraska, and then back to Haverford and so forth. But somewhere in there after, after I left Wellesley, uh, the women's movement sprang up in part in response to um, radical movement on what I would call, or what I think we would all call the American left at that moment so that race studies and gender studies really came together uh, in, in those years uh, to produce women, women studies and black studies that were for my generation anyway, simultaneous movements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to think of those movements as uh, as separate because they were they were interconnected. I mean, even though Black Studies came a little bit before and might have inspired gender studies in terms of their impact on the curriculum in the Humanities Academy. In any case, 
uh, that impact was really a confluence or a, or a convergent movement. So that uh, by the time we reached the 80s, Black studies and, and women's studies were full-fledged, uh, full-throated movements in, in their own way. And it was pretty clear to many of us that even though they were, even though we belonged as black women to black movement and women's movement, what our experiences were, were not, were not represented necessarily in a full and varied and rich enough way in either one of those movements. So what becomes black women's studies or an emphasis on uh, the life and thinking of black women really goes, grows out of that moment when we realized that black women in relationship to both of those movements were really, was really interstitial, right? It fell between the cracks. It, it and, and so one of the germinal texts of those years, all the blacks and men, all the women are white, but some of us are brave, names very precisely what the situation of black women was by the early 1980s. And so those, those essays, uh, interstices, mama's baby, papa's maybe, neither nor, um, the one on the permanent obliquity of an infallibly straight, uh, a look at daughters and uh, fathers, I mean, those essays grew directly out of a need to create the stage for an interlocution between feminists across the racial and cultural divide. Absolutely. Because Black women's life was not an afterthought. It was something that some of us were living very directly every day. Absolutely. And so in, 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 in the effort to uh, respond to that, we had to, we had to put what was, not, what was not there so that the idea of black women at the podium would not any longer be a novel idea or an afterthought or a second thought but that it would become uh, a part of the conversation. In other words, you couldn't, even, you couldn't even constitute the conversation without this particular component in it. And so that's where uh, a, lot of that, a lot of that work comes from. It comes out of uh, the need to help bring about an interlocution between uh, facets of uh, feminist thought in the United States in the late 70s, early 80s. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then, yeah. Now I was gonna say those articles do so much work to destabilize and set about the reconstruction of the category black woman as political signifier. I don't know that anyone who's read Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe will ever forget the opening lines. I'm a marked woman, <laughs> but right. not everybody knows my name. So mm -hmm. I'm curious about, um, so you speak a bit about the social, political, economic conditions that shaped that work in the 1980s. I'm also curious about how you would define the category of black woman now. You know, I've thought about, um that question, Shaniqua, what I would, what I would say about um, that category now, 
And the answer is a little complicated, but I would, I would start it this way. I think it's not always easy for us to keep in mind that when we say black woman, we actually mean at least two different things. One of the things we mean is black women as a historical and empirical reality. And that would mean millions of human beings on the face of the globe in innumerable circumstances, in an infinity of circumstances that can never be accounted for in one breath because we are talking about the span of generations. We're talking across cultures, languages, geographies, and geopolitical circumstance, uh, politics, historical formation, um, educational configurations. I mean, we're talking about um, the African diaspora in its widest possible circumstance from Russia to Scandinavia to the New World, uh, the Caribbean, Canada, the United States, Europe, all of that those millions of human beings that you can never capture and account for on paper, that you can never adequately theorize about because they exceed theory in their life forms. So that's, that's one thing, the empirical and the, the living circumstance of black women. Then there is black woman as a, as a critical category, right? That uh, defines a, a theoretical subject position that uh, you can try and, and, and get a hold of uh, theoretically uh, on paper and that particular uh, category of black woman is concocted both in the academy and outside the academy. I mean, for instance, you and I would, would have such a category. It would probably differ a little bit generationally, but uh, we would we, we would have such a category that we would talk about along several lines of stress. Perhaps intersectional criticism might be one of them. Uh, and then there is another such category that, that, that runs concurrent with or asymptotic to what we would create. And I would call that black woman as a category of public relations. And that category of, of, of public relations is the place where mythology takes shape, where idols, I-D-O-L-S and I-D-Y-L-L-S, where those things form. And that's, that's the place that you, that, 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 that you can't control. And I would say it's at that place that might not differ so much from what it was 20 years ago or 20 years before that, because the, the, the public relations angle is who do people say we are? Not only do what do we what do we say we are, but who do others say we are? And that's um, that is a huge that's a huge that's a huge subject. In some ways, um, 
it has a it has a positive valence and a negative valence and it simply depends on uh who you're talking to what that uh where those or how those those trend lines would point on the positive scale i would look at the situation like this the black woman today is coming into her own as a cluster of images in her positionality in the world at large as an academic, as a public intellectual, um, scientist, jurist, doctor, you name it, a black, the black woman today occupies positions that she was not occupying when I entered the academy in 1974, when I entered the academy uh, 50 years ago. So that's, that's one set of circumstance. The vice president of the United States uh, is is a black woman, uh, one of the wealthiest people in the world um, is a black woman. There are black women CEOs all over the place. If you look at American television today, especially uh, the cable outlets, um, there are black people, black women, or the image of the black woman in nearly every frame. So in, in, in the world of the everyday, uh, black women now do what other <clears throat> cultural subjects do. And I can't, I can't think now of any cultural practice or cultural formation that where, where, where the, the, the image of black women or the imprint of the black woman is absent. So that that contends with the the, the negative valence. Black the, the the black woman who is uh, an object of police violence, domestic violence, underpay underemployment. So those, those two trend lines, one of them pointing up, the other one pointing down, are always lines that are running concurrently. Absolutely, absolutely. Asymptotically, right? So that's, that's what I would say the difference is now, that the trend line that is pointing upward is, is, is a lot richer, more varied, uh, more multiple, more diverse than it was 50 years ago at the same time that we are still threatened by those forces that point downward. Absolutely. The trend lines that, 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 point, that point downward. I'm happy that you raised this. So I, as you were talking about Black women in greater positions of visibility, if you will. Yep. I want to ask you what your thoughts were on the utility of that representation, what some might argue hyper visibility, because as you say, as you note, um, that sits coterminously with downward trending conditions for poor Black women all over the globe. So there's a recent report that was published by the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the Institute for Women's Policy Re Research. It's called the Status of Black Women Report. Alicia Garza also had a hand in it. So they say that they want to evaluate for the very first time and have black women at the center of evaluating data around what's going on with black women in the United States. They raise some compelling statistics. So black women make up about 6.5% of the US population have the highest labor force participation, and yet on the median collect about $35,000 a year. 
are facing crises of houselessness, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we, how do we see these things in tension? How do we balance them? And what, what is the Black feminist project now, given those contradictory realities? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, um, that's a tough one. And a, a, a complex one that has shadowed and haunted the history of Black women in the context of the United States forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go back, for instance, and look at um, that wonderful Schomburg collection, mm -hmm. Black women of the 19th century. The, the, the Schomburg um, Library. If you go back and look at Annie Julia Cooper's, Anna Julia Cooper's Voices from the South, mm -hmm. you will be struck by the contemporaneity of her thinking. In other words, when I reread aspects of that work, uh, fairly recently, it was just amazing to me how contemporaneous her remarks were in the sense that it's like you're looking at a stage in an, a stigmatic way. You get a stigmatism looking at it. I mean, in other words, here's Anna Julia Cooper, uh, who's privileged, uh, as, uh, as a woman, as a black woman, as an American, who's doing very well, I think, uh, a PhD in French from the Sorbonne. Uh, she's, she's, she's doing great. This is the, the, the world at the turn of the century, mm -hmm. who is writing about black women who are doing much less well than herself. And she's trying to, she's trying to ride it. She's trying to ride that contradiction by situating herself athwart it. Mm -hmm. In other words, here's Anna Julia Cooper trying to walk in the shoes of women that um, Booker T. Washington was talking to when he and Du Bois were arguing about what sort of protocol one needed to adopt in relationship to freedmen in the United States. So she's trying to, she's trying to write it. She's trying to figure out a way to say at the same time, there is a class difference between myself and some other black women but the class difference cannot permanently separate us or the class difference must be mounted or it, we have to ride the tension. And so I think that's the situation that we find ourselves in today, that we are on the one hand celebrating at the same time that uh, we are in a state of fear, anxiety, constant anxiety about what could happen if you walk outside your door. I mean, we, we, we tend to forget that uh, Miss Sandra Bland was leaving the campus, if I am not mistaken, of Prairie View College. This was a young woman who was about to become, I think, a young professor at Prairie View when she was stopped by the police. And that was the last time that any of us ever saw her alive again. Right. That could happen to any one of us, that situation right there. Okay. So there you get the confluence Right. of this class problematic that I'm, that I'm talking about. Sandra Bland, for all intents and purposes, 
is not police bait. Right. This is somebody who's not going to disobey the law. This is somebody who is not on welfare, who does not need anything from the state. She doesn't need any of that. This is somebody who is smart, clever, industrious, successful. I mean, all those things you want to name. She's got that going for her at the same time that she is vulnerable to some hysterical human being who decides to stop her because her blinker isn't working or whatever the arbitrary reason is who stops her and because she does not get on her knees and fall down and do obeisance, this person puts her under arrest because he can do that. Now, that kind of stomach turning, sickening reality is what we've still got the United States in the year 2021. 50 years have not changed that at all. At the same time that it's given us more Sandra Bland's in the world, it has given us um, a black woman who at one time uh, was the chief magistrate of the International uh, Criminal Court at The Hague. Uh, it's given us uh, Black women ambassadors. I mean, you name it. We've, we've got it. I mean, they're, they're the Black women doctors on uh, this vaccine that's saving lives. You've got more of that and any one of those women. And that includes, that includes me and you today can leave our house today. And if we are not careful, or if somebody gets hysterical behind a badge or a gun or a taser or a laser, or you name it, our lives can end in a snap. Well, that is extraordinarily upsetting at the same time that it creates the tension that makes us celebratory, right? And it seems to me that we can, we, we are caught, we're caught in the binary, right? We cannot, we cannot leave that situation yet because we are still subjects who are coming fully into our own Whatever that, uh, whatever that's going to mean, that's still evolving. Absolutely. Thank so I, that's the that's the celebratory stage that we're in. At the same time that, uh, as uh, Michelle Obama said just a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. at the same time you're celebrating, you're concerned about the life of your children, Absolutely. the children of your neighbors and what could happen to them and how your children getting something as simple as a driver's license makes you crazy. Absolutely. So who else has that in the United States? I know no other community in, 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 in the life and thought of the United States that is living that kind of astigmatism or that kind of necessity to be touched on the pulse of the nerve by the situation that you live every day. And I think that is the thing that gives black personality its heightened conscience or consciousness, however you want to call that. I think that's the reason why, because we're always balancing, right? That situation that is split between life possibility and vulnerability, Absolutely. danger, Absolutely. precarity. Absolutely. So Black feminists have productively written about the complicated realities that structure various institutions, carceral and state institutions, 
university, the church, and so on and so forth. What is the relationship between a Black feminist vision of justice and what's been more recently embraced as a politics of abolition? You know, I, I, I sort of think those two ideas might be synonymous or interrelated or overlapping. Uh, I guess I could, I guess I would say that um, Black feminists, or I would say the Black feminist project from everything I understand about it and the history of it has always projected a politics of abolition. It hasn't always called it that. Um, it's, it's, it's called it uh, the insurgent ground. It's talked about revolutionary possibility. It's talked about uh, radical transformation. It's talked about civil disobedience. Uh, it's, it's, it's called the abolitionist possibility a number of things, but um, I think a politics of, of abolition and uh, the Black Feminist Project would have some of the same aims, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the same, uh, maybe some of the same ways uh, to get there so that from that from that point of view they would they would they would be related absolutely absolutely so in your 2006 new centennial review article which you mentioned at the top of the conversation the idea of black culture you work rigorously so rigorously within a critical theoretical tradition to to arrive at an understanding of culture that is distinctly i'm going to bracket anti-black forgive the oversimplification here, but you come to the conclusion that any idea of culture, American culture, Western culture, legal culture, social justice culture, is rooted in Black exploitation and exclusion, or to borrow a formulation from Kianga Yamada Taylor, a kind of predatory inclusion. And I see that in connection with how you're thinking through the visibility um, of Black women, middle-class and elite Black women, um, within the public sector. So we're arguably in a cultural moment where it's become completely culturally appropriate to either denounce Black life as one's personal, political, cultural, as part of one's personal, political, cultural project or subjectivity, or to claim an affinity for Black life as part of one's political subjectivity. So I'm thinking of Black Lives Matter. So how do you view these twin cultural impulse, impulses are these impulses two sides of the same anti-Black coin? How do you imagine a way forward? And where does spirit or spirituality fit in? Because at the end of that article, the idea of Black culture, you say that a dose of the, a dose of the incredible spirit world is necessary to bring about the repair of the psychic damage of slavery and serves as an antidote to the beleaguered status of Black women in contemporary America. So what did you mean here? Yeah, I <laughs> that that you, I don't I don't recognize the quote. I'm going to go back and get that that yes. article because I was trying to I was thinking now is that my quote or was that was that someone paraphrasing what what I was saying? Um in that in that article that uh you're referencing in the uh in the Centennial Review what I was trying to get at was the extent to which Black culture gives its name to all culture. Mm -hmm. In other words, what I'm what I'm what I'm what I'm really getting at there is that if you if you trace it out, if you track it, if you track it out, Black culture in its radicality, in the kinds of questions that it is raising about human possibility, in its resistance to the 
antisocial and the inhuman is itself the work of culture. Mm -hmm. So that to give it that name would mean that uh, there's culture apart from it. And what I'm trying to do is dismantle that idea so that what I'm really saying is that uh, perhaps the only culture is really black culture, really, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's really where I'm, that's where that article is, is, is trying to go. It's a, it's a bigger subject that, that, that I really am trying to work out in, in the project called um, the idea the idea of black culture and so that's that's what I'm that's that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to argue I would say that as I as I see it the way we formulate this question, gives everybody a reprieve from consequences. Mm -hmm. So that the only people who bear consequences or must pay the piper or must bear consequences are, are black people. And so what, what I am suggesting is that if you, if you keep pushing the contradictions far enough, you get a kind of torque movement in the culture so that you involve more and more life of the nation in the questions that you're asking so that eventually black people are not the only people who are accountable. Right. Everybody is eventually accountable for what happens in the democracy. That it is not just the work of black people or black lives matter. It's not just the work of those communities to save the culture. Right. right? I mean, so much of white life acts as if all oh, the things that are happening out in the street don't have anything to do with me. Police brutality or what happened at the Capitol on the 6th of January, mm -hmm. or the insane recounting of the vote in Arizona. I mean, I don't understand why the nation, why the United States is not outraged by what is happening with this, with this counting the votes again. Who are these people in Arizona? Are they children? <laughs> and why are we tolerating this? You mean to tell me there's nobody who can stop this? I've never seen anything like this in my life. What happened at the United States Capitol on the 6th of, of, of January is a shame before God. I mean, it is an, it's incredible to me that we suffer this daily. Absolutely. So what, so what is it about life in the United States that only particular groups of people bear the burden of the historical. So that it seems to me, the anti-blackness is denying the burden of history in relationship to yourself. Right, absolutely. So that when the country comes into its own, it acknowledges what its own history is. And it seems to me that it's in that acknowledgement that the work of culture becomes the work of everybody in the culture, but, but, but that that work will have been led by black community of necessity because it understands something about danger and about dying because it has had to withstand so much of it. So that's what, that's what that article was really getting at. And that's, that's where I come out today, that what I would like to see is the, the, the society to come into an understanding of what critical culture is. And so for me, black culture is critical culture. 
critical culture is black culture. And that is the ultimate goal, as I see it, of what culture is supposed to do. That's what leads us to, I think, the kind of, of humane living that, uh, that, that we all want. I mean, we should not have to fear leaving our house every day because of police brutality or because my neighbor is going to lose her mind or his mind and shoot the first nine people that they see that walk out their door. What is that about? That's not just, that's not just a black problem. That's a critical social problem that we are not solving because we don't think that as a society, it has anything to do with us, but it does. And I think that's what black culture has been screaming all these years, that this is about you also. It's not just about me and my status, right? So that's, that's where I see that. Absolutely. What does that look like? This is a really frank, candid question. In everyday political praxis, I just, <laughs> I see blackness, black culture being claimed in such fungible ways, you know, even and especially in the context of Black Lives Matter, which is part of where my question stems. So what is you a humane way, a black feminist way of taking up culture as black culture as critical culture? Like, have you seen an everyday manifestation of that? How it would work as, as uh, yeah. Quotidian praxis. Yeah, well, I would, I would say this. I live in, now this is a very small example. It might even be a petty one, but um, I take heart in an example like this. In my neighborhood in Nashville, and I live in East Nashville, which is the other side of the Cumberland River. And this side of Nashville uh, gets a lot of storms, right? Uh, it's also that part of Nashville that uh, is not official Nashville. It might be a little more mixed, a little more varied, uh, racially and in what people do for a living. So there, there are all kinds of people in my neighborhood. I can now think of three different places in my neighborhood, three or four different places in my neighborhood where Black Lives Matter signs are propped up. And they, they, they don't get damaged. Um, I also remember that uh, I saw Biden-Harris signs in my neighborhood last year, just as I saw Obama-Biden signs um, in previous years. What does that mean? I think that means that there is a level of consciousness, at least on this side of town, that would suggest to me that somebody who may or may not be black people, but that that somebody, some people who are anonymous, anonymous to me are taking up issues that are important to me and that, that are important to a collective. That would be an example of it. People participating in black movement across the country who may or may not be black people would be an example, I think, from, from the everyday world mm -hmm. that would show that, uh, well, that it, 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 it can happen and it happens uh, gradually and slowly and it happens all the time and, uh, and it's, it's, it, it's, good, it's good to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that example. Yeah. And for your brilliance as ever. I think we have to turn it over to questions from the audience now. Prof Spillers, I'm happy to read them aloud. 
Okay. So going to go to Napoleon's question, mm -hmm. what is the role and responsibility of black men? Yeah, the role and responsibility of uh, black men, um, as I see it, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't really shift. I mean, I think with, uh, with, with black men, uh, the responsibility is what it's, what it's always been. And I think it's, it is a burden that black men are often um, called upon to bear and many of them bear it uh, quite, uh, quite courageously, right? And that is to, to work alongside black women democratically uh, to, to bring about a, a better synthesis, a stronger democratic synthesis. And as I, as I say in, in, in the Mama's Baby, uh, Papa's Maybe piece, I think black men are poised to understand something that other men are not necessarily going to understand so well uh, because they, they think they have been excused from history or from the burden of history. I think black men very often understand that burden and can sympathize with the, the feminine that they bear within, within themselves. And I think, that's, I think that's the power of black men. I'm not saying that happens in every case. Right. I mean, we know certainly uh, enough black men who's, who simply repeat uh, what the culture would have the male repeat. And that is a kind of backward movement. I mean, we've certainly seen enough of that. But, 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 but forward thinking uh, black men, I think understand uh, very well how their role and, and, and the role of others are really complementary. Right? Yeah. Thank you. I have a question from Jolicia, which I'm going to paraphrase if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible to acquire democracy within a nation state built on anti Black violence, as you so carefully outlined in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe? Mm, no, I don't think that on anti Black violence no i don't i don't think it's possible to uh build anything on on anti-black violence i mean i think anti-black violence as we see is destroying this culture it can certainly not build a a new one or a revised and corrected one because anti-black violence so far as I am concerned, is anti-human and does not recognize itself as uh, an anti-human form or does not recognize itself as a human response that has not come into its humanity. In other words, what I'm saying, in order for somebody to put his foot on my neck for nine minutes means that not only is that person killing me, but something is wrong with the person who's doing that. That's not a human being who's doing that. I mean, that's, that's, that's another state of being so far as I'm concerned. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's another human condition. I mean, that person hasn't come into human form yet. And so that whole anti-Blackness tip, so far as I am concerned, um, wherever it is installed, 
I don't think installs uh, culture. I think it. I think it's anti-culture, or uh, dysfunctional, or anti-human. It's 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 anti-human movement, as I see it. I have a question from Larissa, who says, "Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to tune into this talk." Larissa has begun to think of Black feminist thought or the Black feminist project. Larissa, or Larissa's thinking that the Black feminist project makes feminist thought at large relevant. Is this fair to say? Is this the correct understanding of the dynamic? That 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 Black feminist thought makes feminist thought at large relevant. Is that fair to say? Larissa asks. You know, I think. At, at, at some point, um, Black feminist thought and feminist thought merge in, in, in this sense. I don't think you can really carry out feminist thought in some kind of neutral way. Right? I mean, in other words, there is Gray's anatomy, but then there is my body right. as a human being, right? right? And so that, I would say that that is analogous to uh, feminist thought, that we can think about feminist thought as um, some kind of, 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 of categorical entity or punctuality, but when you inhabit it, it always becomes a particular thing. Uh, it, is, it is always vested with particularity of situation, moment, name, place, circumstance, so that um, there, is, there is feminist thought but then there is only feminist thought as it is carried out by particular subjects, right? Or particular instances. And that, yeah, that's the way I would, I would answer that. I, I love that. It sounds like it runs parallel to your ideas of culture and the idea of Black culture. Right. So in other yeah. words, doing feminist thought, <laughs> unless it bears a material and substantive relationship to Black feminist thought. Right, right, exactly, yeah. So Emily, uh, oh, go. No, I was just thinking, if it's in the head of a particular person, um, then it, it takes on um, the, the coloration, I guess, pun intended, it takes on the coloration and circumstance of that uh, situation specificity. Absolutely, absolutely. So Emily Rose says that it would be an honor to hear Professor Spiller's thoughts on the current situation in Palestine and the effects of imperialism on the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, the situation of, of, of Palestine um, is still unfolding today. Um, and I would, I, I would like for someone to, to address that. I don't, I don't understand what's, what's going on there, right? In this conflict uh, between uh, the Palestinian people and the Israeli people. If there if there's anybody in the audience who can who can raise a hand uh, to address that situation, I would be glad to listen. Uh, and imperialism, we always have with us in the sense that uh, there are power asymmetries, mm -hmm. and it may be that in the Palestinian Israeli situation we are looking at asymmetrical power, right? that we're looking at um, one side that is more powerful than another side. 
in that case, what is the what's the what's the obligation of the of the empowered in relationship to the less powerful? Absolutely. And as I see it, that is that is the situation uh, in in the Middle East now, and perhaps that defines what that situation has been all along. Right. I mean, how do you address uh, those asymmetries of, uh, of power? And what was the other part of that question in relationship to the- Black Lives Matter movement? It, in relationship to the imperial or the- Im Imperialism, yeah. Yeah, imperialism. Insofar as police power is the state speaking, I guess you could say that that would within itself identify uh, another one of those asymmetrical power instances. I mean, a police officer with a no-knock warrant and uh, a gun on one hip and a taser uh, on the other has power over whoever it is he or she is confronting at the moment. Would you call that imperialism, uh, uh, imperialistic reflex? Mm, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what you would what what you would call it. We usually think of the empirical, though, in relationship to uh, large entities confronting one another, and large entities in 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 confrontation in an asymmetrical way that gives one more power than another. I don't know if you would say that that's applicable to the situation that Black Lives Matter is drawing attention to uh, or not. I mean, it, 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 may, it may be applicable. I wouldn't immediately think that though, if I were just thinking off, off the cuff, I would say that uh, they, are, they are a little different. That Black Lives Matter would be more immediate and circumstantial, closer to the bone than uh, the empirical, which I would see somewhat at a distance and perhaps involving institutional formation uh, more directly than um, Black Lives Matter is dealing with. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So Karen Hodges um, identifies, self-identifies as a white woman who was a grad student at Brandeis in the 60s. Karen is now only beginning to learn what Karen has needed to know all along about the dark side of American culture. How can Black studies be more thoroughly integrated into the canon of what any well-educated person is supposed to know? Well, one way that um, it can be integrated more thoroughly, I suppose you could say that it is to do more of what we're doing now, except that there is so much resistance to it. This is an example of uh, what I mean. The 1619 Project, for example. I mean, the 1619 Project has gotten such backlash that it's ridiculous. Why is it that, that we are being called upon to choose between 1619 and 1776? Right. They belong to the same sequence of movements that put the United States in motion. 
1619 is the year of Europeans arriving on these shores, as well as Africans arriving on these shores where indigenous people already were. You can yell and scream and, and resist all day long. You can't change that fact. So the problem we're having is that there is a resistance to history by what is called the right wing in the United States. And that is people who are not only ignorant of history, but disdainful of it and resistant to it. And so what I am suggesting is that we've got to find ways to break through the disdainful, proud, resistant ignorance to what American history is. And American history, if you think about it, begins long before 1619, right? I mean, if you, if, if you want to, if you want to choose some other year, you could say 1492. That's another kind of year. Or you could say the mid 15th century when the transatlantic slave trade begins in Lisbon. I mean, there are many years that, uh, that one can start talking about movement that eventually lands European settlers and African captives on the shores of the United States that belongs to the larger Americas, which is the larger New World complex that includes North and South America and the Caribbean. You have to talk about all of that. Absolutely. And to resist it, that really makes me sick. And so we've got to find a way to stop people from resisting with, um, oh, I don't know, dumb concepts like cancel culture, woke culture. I mean, all these ugly words and terms that don't, that don't mean anything because people want to stay asleep. Right. Or they want to stay infants. They want to be, they want to stay little children rather than grow up and, and confront what we need to confront as grown people. And we have to confront living as adults. That includes confronting what the United States is, which was not created overnight okay. or out of thin air or out of a vacuum. I mean, it came out of the world as it existed all those centuries before it became a democratic republic in 1789. Absolutely. That's what we've got to break through. Absolutely. Got to break through. Yeah. I think that work needs to happen in everyday life. Very <laughs> everyday fine-grained life. Just as a quotidian example, my kiddo came home the other day and said that she was learning about the American or no, no, the Revolutionary War. So she's, you know, parsing all of these definitions, the Federalist, the Loyalist, etc. And I wrote to her teacher immediately and said, do you realize that you're teaching the history of indigenous genocide, anti-Black <laughs> exclusion? Like, are, are we talking about these things from the perspectives of Black and Indigenous people? If not, why are you teaching my child this history in the age of Black Lives Matter? Like, if there's going to be time for an intervention to do something else with knowledge production, it's it's now. <laughs> Look, it's now. Okay. There, there, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the need to talk about our history as holistically right. and as accurately as we can is such a necessity, right? That um, we are not, we are not, we 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 are not meeting it. You know, I mean, there are these binary oppositions that 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 simply don't work. I mean, you have to you have you can't do sixteen nineteen if you're gonna do seventeen seventy six or seventeen eighty nine. If you're gonna do seventeen eighty nine, you can't do sixteen nineteen. How dumb is that? Right. <laughs> 
I mean, those things belong to, you know, uh, uh, the, the same fabric uh, or the same human stage. So you can't, you really can't do one without, without doing the other. I mean, without 1619, there is no 1789. Or 1776. And without 1776, 1789, 1619, uh, there is no civil war. And 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 on and on and on. And without, you know, uh indigenous communities uh being destroyed, I mean, there is no real estate that makes way for settlers who settle the United States. I mean, it's it's all a part. Absolutely. Of the same picture. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a number of questions. We won't get to all of them. I'm going to group and synthesize a bit. So from Carmel Omen. Hey, Carmel. Um, can I ask if there's a particular book or text you're sitting with these days? I'm going to group that with Ariel and Dakua tuning in from Chicago. Can you talk more about the pedagogical approaches you use to bring Black feminisms to life for your students? one more and you can count on me to synthesize from an anonymous attendee prof spillers thinking about your formation formation as a literary scholar and you're thinking about black culture as critical culture are there any 21st century literary works that you recommend for the critique they offer of our contemporary circumstances so i hear these questions asking like what are some texts that we could be reading now Oh my goodness, there's so many, there's so many of them that um, that we could be reading now. I'll just uh, say a few things at, uh, at random. I've been thinking about in a systematic way, um, black thought formation. Uh, when we say the idea of black culture or when we say uh, black studies. Uh, what are we, what are we talking about? And I'm trying to do that in a systematic way. Some of the thinkers that I am looking at, in connection with that that, that question, include Denise De Silva's mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. on. Um, and I'm not going to get the title right. You can correct me here, Shaniqua on the title of her book on uh, on race. Is it race, race theory? Uh, oh, I need to uh, look that up. Toward a global idea of race. Toward a global idea of race. That would be one. Um, Barbara and Karen Fields, race craft, mm -hmm. and I would just add that uh, Barbara Fields is a Brandeisian who was in graduate school at the same time that I was in graduate school. Barbara was in sociology uh, at the same time that I was in English. Uh, her sister is a historian. And they, they, they put together race craft. I would include I would include that one. I would include uh, the figure of X, uh, Nam Chandler's mm -hmm. uh, the Negro as a problem for thought. Um, Alex Wahaley's habeas viscous. I would include that. Uh, and any number of works by um, Black feminists now. Uh, your work, Shaniqua. Thank you. Would, 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 would be in that. Um, Rebecca Threadcraft's work. Uh, Aliyah Abdur Rahman. Christina Sharp. The Kia Iman Jackson. Okay, yeah. I would say I would say all of those would be would be would be work for for starters. 
Right. Yeah. Thank you. So what are some of the, this is from an anonymous attendee, what are some of the underemphasized questions of Black feminism that you would like to see younger Black women, I'll extend that out to Black feminist, intellectual activists pursue? In other words, what do we need to know and why? I would, I would love to see us extend our psychoanalytic probe. Uh, I would, I would love to see more work on um, traumas associated with the historical progression of uh, African diasporic subjects. Um, I think we have not done quite enough of that work yet. We're beginning to do more of it, but I would, I would like to see even more of it. I mean, for instance, one of the questions uh, that, that I have, and it is, it's a, it's a big subject, is the extent to which the Oedipus complex and the Fanonians would say there is no Oedipus complex among Black folk. That's what Fanon says in Black Skin and White Masks. I think he's wrong, uh, but I would, I would like to see that subject uh, pursued um, because some people do think, some scholars do think there is such a thing as, as African Oedipus. In the event that there is uh, an African Oedipus, I would like to know how we would read that today in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And if the Oedipus complex is what I think it is, and that is children coming into their own or children becoming authority figures, children being given permission by their elders to become authority figures or the torch being passed from one generation to the next or the baton being passed from one generation to the next. I think that's what it is. I would say that that's what the Oedipus complex is, and that that happens in all cultures all the time and always has across the generations, whether we call it the Oedipus complex or not, that that transfer of power takes place. If that was interrupted by middle passage, in the case of African personality, what difference does that make to life today in the diaspora? That's a question that I am that I am posing to myself and I welcome anybody who would like to help out <laughs> answering that question because I think it would take us far in understanding horizontal or intramural relations. Yep. In other words, if I understand what my vertical relationship is, that is my, my relationship to my ancestors, then that helps me grasp better what my horizontal relationship is to my contemporaries or those people who are elbow to elbow rather than the ones who are above or below me. So I see those axes intersecting and I think that 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 question um, or those those issues could be advanced uh, if we if we took them up a little bit more. Absolutely. So one last question I'm going to give it to Michelle. I'll acknowledge a number of Afro pessimist questions super important, but I'm going to direct you to Prof Spiller's upcoming talk with Lewis Gordon. Final question, how do you find joy? How do you find joy? How do you, Professor Spiller's, find joy? Okay. Um, 
You know, I find joy because I am to myself a very funny person. <laughs> <laughs> to myself, I can laugh a lot because uh, I find the world very often a funny place. I find myself funny in it. I find other people funny in relationship to myself. I think my, sis, my, my, I think my sense of humor uh, was never destroyed by um, a world that is not always kind. Uh, it was not destroyed by the isolation that we are just coming out of. Um, I can still laugh. I can still take joy in other people, in the company of other people. I really am a gregarious person. I mean, I really am a company loving person. I mean, in other words, a, a friend of mine is going to pick me up in a couple of hours and we are going to um, go to dinner and we will probably laugh a lot and we'll probably drink some champagne and we will have a good dinner and I will have a glass of wine with my dinner and I'll come home tickled uh, because I'm happy. I'm not gonna have to drive. Somebody else is driving the car. So, you know, I, I enjoy uh, I enjoy living despite of the agony that I experience along with uh, all the rest of us because the world is in a wretched state and because we are all in danger and because we live with danger. At the same time that we live in danger, we have to find a way to turn away or get enough distance from the danger to find joy. And I do that a lot. I mean, I really give myself a lot of room to be silly, to laugh, not to think about anything too much or too hard, to watch the idiot box and scream at the television, uh, to um, poke fun at something, to enjoy flowers growing in uh, the flower bed out in my yard. I mean, I, I, I make time for myself and that's, that's the way I make joys. I welcome the sunrise daily because very often I'm up at sunrise because I haven't gone to bed yet. So <laughs> I take joy in the sound of the birds and the, the, I'm glad to see light in the sky that you know we haven't done something stupid to drive out the sunlight. I mean, I take, I take joy uh, in all of that. And I can do that because I think I've learned over the years, you have to, you have to give yourself distance. Right? You have to create distance between yourself and the world. You really have to live in that interface between the world and me, or you have to act like there is an interface or an invisible line or filter that separates you from the world, that gives you that, uh, that distance. You can't live without it. Absolutely. You know, we can't live... Uh, was data coming in all the time. I mean, at some point you have to you have to stop it and step back. And so I honor that um, in myself that I can that, that that I can do that, and that's where that's where my uh, that's where the joy comes from. Absolutely. And I can laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Even all these years later, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah joy and brilliance with us today. I know I've learned so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for this conversation. This, it's, been, it's been wonderful okay. to see you, Janiqua, and I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity that, that, that we had to, 
have this conversation. I wish we could have talked more about your own work. I know, but you know. I'd love to do that sometime. That's another conversation and I'll be in touch. Okay. <laughs> exactly. That, that can be our next event. <laughs> we would love to do that. Thank you yeah. both so much, um, Dr. Roach. Thank you for facilitating, for curating beautiful questions that allowed us to learn so much about Dr. Spiller's uh, and your beautiful work uh, in life. So thank you uh, both for being here. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us virtually. We had over a hundred guests and I think that really speaks to the value of your work and your legacy. Um, we look forward to all of us, all of you joining us for our spring uh, alumni college virtual series that'll be happening in the months of May and June. Um, next week's program is Georgia O'Keeffe, a life in the inaugural event of the Brandeis University Press Author Series with Brandeis professor Nancy Scott and author Roxana Robinson on May 19th from 12 to 1.30 Eastern time. Um, and we just greatly appreciate everyone's participation and your continued support of Brandeis University. So thank you for being with us in community here. Thank you to our speakers and have a nice evening, everyone.